On behalf of the Commission on Parliamentary Reform, Mr Finney. Um, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. I am delighted to be opening this debate on the report and recommendations of the Commission on Parliamentary Reform. Uh, when Donald Dewar made his opening speech in the Scottish Parliament, he remarked that the past is part of us, but today there is a new voice in the land, the voice of a democratic parliament, a voice to shape Scotland, a voice for the future. And it was with that uh, in mind, looking to the future, that the Commission for Parliamentary Reform set about its work. As you know, President Officer, the Commission was uh, established by your good self, with the remit to consider the Parliament's ability to act as a check and a balance on government how Parliament engaged with those out with the Parliament and Parliament's identity as distinct from the Scottish Government's identity. The Commission was made up of five party representatives, uh, Fiona MacLeod, Joanne Lamont, Jackson Carlaw, John Edward and myself, and five representatives from Civic Scotland, Katie Burke, a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament, Pam Duncan Clancy, the very Reverend Dr Lorna Boyd, Geoff Maudsley and Professor Boyd Robertson, and our Chair uh, John McCormack. I was delighted to see uh, one of the um, I was delighted to be one of the members of the Commission and was particularly keen to ensure that the recommendations to support MSPs as parliamentary parliamentarians were considered. Um, it's been an interesting journey that the Commission has taken. Perhaps not the most thrilling part of that journey was a three-hour stoppage on the Inverness to uh, um, Edinburgh train, which I see Mr Carlo remembers fondly and resulted in us being in at 2 a.m. Um, but there's been a, a lot of really meaningful engagement, and a part of that was to hear the views of people outside the Holyrood bubble, as Burns would say, to see ourselves as others see us. So we just did that, speaking with and hearing from over 1,200 people across 50 events. And one message was loud and clear, excuse me, <coughs> that the Parliament and its members are well respected and valued, and the Parliament is now embedded in Scottish life. And that's a considerable achievement for a Parliament that's just 18 years old. So whilst people were quick to highlight the very positive experiences, we also heard how the Parliament could improve further. We th sought the views of parliamentary colleagues, old and new, and those within the Holyrood bubble, or as they're often described, the usual suspect. Their views and experiences were particularly informed our recommendations about parliamentary proceedings and how effectively the Parliament can hold government to account. We also sought the views of those less direct involvement with the Parliament, often described as hard to reach, but I think we agreed, and it was in one of our submissions, easy to ignore groups. These are our people, our constituents, whose lives are affected by the decisions we make in this institution. Their views about what they expect from Parliament and their relationship with Parliament have been at the heart of our recommendations. So I'd like to thank everyone that we met over the course of the nine months. That was from Skye to Easter House, Dumfries to Fort William, and many points in between. And people embraced the opportunity to tell us about their parliament. And they did see it as their parliament. Some people we met just wanted more information about the parliament, its business and members. Some people questioned why the parliament worked in a particular way. Why, for example, as we heard today, opposition leaders asked diary questions at FMQs, something described as, I would rather quote here, tedious and pointless, and which doesn't hold First Minister to account. Uh, by the way, we agree in that recommendation that these diary questions should be scrapped. Others had more radical views, such as setting up a second chamber or creating more MSPs, both of which we consider might be options for consideration, but only after the reforms we recommend have been implemented. We viewed it as a, important that there was a workload analysis and we maximised the existing resources before these uh, uh, options be considered. Our report contains 75 recommendations, and I cannot do them justice in, in the short time I have, so I'll focus on some of the key recommendations. I know my, my colleague, Joanne Lamont, will focus on other aspects of the report, which are nonetheless important. In terms of our Parliament, uh, our, indeed, the Parliament's ability to hold the government, can we make a number of recommendations aimed at strengthening the Parliament? A stronger Parliament not only helps clarify its identity as distinct from that of the Scottish Government, but its results in better policies to improve the lives of the Scottish people. We have recommended smaller committees with conveners elected by the Parliament to provide openness and independence with a renewed focus on engaging with users of the public services as part of the scrutiny process. We recommend these committees should seek a better balance between meeting people in committee meetings and speaking with those directly uh, affected directly by the issues we seek to address. These voices can enhance scrutiny by reflecting how policies actually affect those on the ground. We found that people had realistic expectations about how often committees should go out to communities uh, to hear their views, but they also wanted their views uh, taken on board more often in their communities and in more dynamic and innovative ways than at present. So if we'd have recommended greater use of emerging digital technologies, 
and piloting ways of deliberative ways of seeking views uh, as ways the, par uh, the Parliament can uh, evolve and, uh, and seek uh, to engage with people remote from the Parliament at, at the moment. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. We recommend an expanded five-stage legislative process uh, to mainstream pre-legislative scrutiny. Um, th this will enable draft legislation to be considered at the earlier, uh, at the earlier in the process wh when we heard more influence could be exerted, including post-legislative scrutiny at, at a final stage would ensure that the legislation already enacted is doing the job it was intended. We want to uh, reinvigorate the role of MSPs as parliamentarians to act in the interests of the parliament and improving policy making, not just as party members, but also as individuals. To that, I commend, to that end, we, we recommend opening up the parliamentary bureau to make how it works and decides on the business more transparent, especially to allow parties greater flexibility to reallocate speaking time and introducing the opportunity for questions on the forthcoming business programme. We also recommend providing greater opportunities for backbench MSPs to influence and inform parliamentary business, including establishing a backbench group or committee. We also recommend the presiding officer and party representatives agree key principles on when party discipline is appropriate in the parliamentary process and perhaps more appropriately uh, when it is not. Yes, indeed. Neil Findlay. Uh, um, issues that, uh, that I've seen within the report is around um, the way in which committees operate and that, ref that relates to discipline. I understand that at least one party in here operates a committee whip, which I think goes against the whole you know, principle of what we're supposed to be doing on committees. I wonder if the, committee, if the um, uh, Commission took any evidence on that. John Finney. Yes. Indeed, it was, it's, a, it's a recurring theme, theme and it was about um, understanding the very distinct role of the parliamentarian to scrutinise the government regardless of, of party. Uh, and uh, we do comment on that within the report. Um, um, now, over the last few months, it's become clear that the Parliament is facing greater scrutiny challenges in relation to its already enhanced powers, as well as demands arising from the United Kingdom exiting from the European Union. The Parliament's capacity to meet these challenges head on was an issue that we returned to time and again when we spoke to people. Our rec recommendations as to how to fully utilise existing capacity provide a package of measures which can be used to meet that challenge. We recommend greater flexibility in how Parliament time is used. Our recommendation that committees should be able to meet at the same time as the Chamber will open up uh, more uh, committee time for scrutiny um, and meeting away from the Parliament. And that should invigorate or uh, uh, reinvigorate uh, chamber debates. It will provide greater flexibility to those committees meeting on a Thursday morning when currently their business is curtailed at 11.40 a.m. Using a research uh, on the business of Parliament, we have identified opportunities for Parliament to change its meeting pattern, such as deciding some weeks to dedicating some weeks to committee business while others focus on chamber debates, better reflecting the scrutiny demands of parliamentary business. Um, before I close, President Officer, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each of my colleagues on the Commission for their good work, enthusiasm and commitment to undertaking this piece of work. Each of us came with a, a different experience and perspectives, and these have informed our work and enriched our deliberations, and I hope our rec recommendations uh, reflect this. Um, I'd particularly like to thank John McCormick for his excellent chairing, his hard work, and it was considerable work. I think his commitment was over a prolonged period. Uh, uh, reflect his uh, long-standing uh, public service. An adept handling of our expansive remit and delivering such a comprehensive and we think workable recommendations uh, is noteworthy. Our 75 recommendations are the first steps in the process of parliamentary reform. I hope the momentum we have gained over the past nine months will be maintained by the Parliament as part of the implementation group we have recommended. It will be for us to all consider and agree what must happen next. This debate um, is the beginning of what is clear to all those we talk to. Um, I particularly enjoyed my engagement with young people in uh, Falkirk and being lured there by the offer of pizza to engage with um, some of them, I think, is, is a thing something we could maybe commend other groups to consider. Um, the Parliament now needs to move on from the way it works. The future scrutiny challenges we face will come, and now is the time to prepare ourselves. Our report just does just that, and I hope that you can all support our recommendations. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. In a second, we'll turn to the open part of the debate, and I'll call uh, Colin Beattie to be followed by Ruth Davison. But before I do, could I just welcome a number of guests to our gallery, including uh, General Nick Ashmore and his family, head of the Army in Scotland, 
uh, members of the Parliamentary Commission itself, including in particular the staff, but also John Edward and the Commission Chair, John McCormack. <laughs> Colin Beattie, to be followed by Ruth Davidson. Presiding Officer, this report's timely and does move pa parliamentary committees forward. Uh, my congratulations to Professor John Cormack and other members of the Commission, and I'll return to the content in a moment. But first, I would like to draw members' attention to a small but significant omission from this report. This report does deal only with parliamentary committees and the appointment, membership and management of those committees. There is, however, another unique organisation which Parliament directly appoints and to which political parties nominate members. Of course, members will immediately understand that I'm referring to the Scottish Commission for Public Audit, the only statutory commission which Parliament possesses, consisting of five MSPs from across, across the political spectrum. And the Commission does choose to follow most of the same processes as the parliamentary committee system and is supported by SPCB in carrying out its work. And in some respects, it's ahead of the parliamentary committees in that in 2016, it elected its chair for the first time. Let, let me remind you that the function of the Commission is to appoint the non-executive board members to Audit Scotland, to appoint the chair of the board, to appoint the accountable officer for Audit Scotland, to appoint auditors to audit Audit Scotland and receive these audited accounts, scrutinise Audit Scotland's budget proposals, and to comment and recommend or not recommend them. Perhaps in respect to my comments on the Commission, I can ask if consideration might be made to requiring it to be included in any changes that are agreed, since otherwise there can be a risk that it might be left behind in some aspects, while the parliamentary committee system gradually moves in a different direction. I do appreciate the relative independence of the Commission, but it's sufficiently close to a parliamentary committee and its essential attributes that the argument to include, I believe, is strong. Turning now to the report by the Commission on Parliamentary Reform, these parliamentary committees are important to supporting the efficient and effective running of the Parliament, and it's my strong impression that members of these committees are increasingly under pressure time-wise as the business of the Parliament expands, both in terms of the complexity of the ongoing business being handled and considering the additional work which will come as a result of further devolved powers coming to this Parliament. And I fully agree with the conclusion that members should consist of no more than seven members. I'm a member of a committee with seven members and a committee with 11 members. I'm convinced that the smaller committee is just as effective. I can get through rather more work even due to less pressure on time, due to all the members requiring to ask questions of witnesses in turn. This would also potentially release members to be redeployed into other possibly new committees. While understanding the rationale behind uh, a proposal possibly to look at the remuneration of conveners, there are risks behind this. I think the last thing any of us want is a member seeking a convenership merely because it attracts an extra cash benefit for doing so. And those of us who have been local government councillors will understand the dynamics which can drive such situations and the disharmony which can be created. Of course. Joanne Lamont. I wonder if you would share the same concern that people might seek ministerial office for the same base reasons rather than to serve the public? <laughs> <laughs> Colin Beattie. I'm sure there are, there are arguments in that. But I, I'm, unconv I'm unconvinced that money will provide a better convener or a better committee system. I've been fortunate that the committees of which I'm a member have both sought to meet outside Parliament and to seek evidence outside Parliament. And the recommendation that more time should be spent by committees seeking views in different ways, including local and regional, is welcome. There's a cost, but also in terms of cost to the attending member due to the usually substantial additional time needed to attend such meetings. I'm convinced there's merit in improving such alternatives and welcome these options being developed. Given the time pressures on committee, it's appropriate they should have the ability to decide when they wish to meet, even if it's within the same time as the chamber. Having said that, I believe it might prove a challenge to arrange for a full attendance of members, given the calls and members' time to participate. Unfortunately, I don't have time to comment on everything. My time is up. But I do commend this report, and, I, and I'm sure it will take the committee system forward. Thank you very much. I call Ruth Davison to be followed by John Mason. Thank you very much. And let me start by thanking you, Presiding Officer, to John McCormack and to all the commissioners for the work that was put into pulling this uh, report together. The Scottish Parliament has been in existence for 18 years, and I think that it's right that we take stock, uh, that we critically reflect on its operation, and that we allow it to change for the better. 
Uh, and I think that it must change, not least because the last few years have seen the biggest transfer of powers to this chamber since the parliament itself was reconvened. And it is our responsibility to ensure that, that this parliament, the most powerful devolved legislature in the world, works for the benefit of all of Scotland. So I'm sure that MSPs from right across the chamber recognise not only was this an important and challenging body of work, but the recommendations from yourself and the commissioners are largely balanced and welcome. I also think that it's important that we discuss the Commission's work in the Chamber today and indeed in the future. Uh, some of the recommendations, I believe, require broader scrutiny and a proper debate. And it goes without saying that the Parliament as a whole needs to have a say on its own future. Um, so I'm pleased to, to see that some of the Commission's recommendations include things that people on, on these benches have been asking for for quite some time. And for example, our Strathclyde Commission report published more than three years ago now suggested guaranteed slots for opposition spokespeople during portfolio question time, something that the Parliamentary Reform Commission has now recommended too. I think that this step, among others, will undoubtedly improve the ability of this chamber to hold the government of the day to account. And there are other recommendations that I'm especially pleased to see in the report. Steps to make committees more powerful and independent, more flexibility around the sitting time of the chamber, as well as committee sessions and a more rigorous legislative process. And on the last of these in particular, I'm pleased to see a much greater emphasis on post-legislative scrutiny. The Scottish Conservatives asked for post-legislative scrutiny to be specifically included in the remit of one of our mandatory committees. And I think that making it a dedicated stage of all bills legislative process ties in very well with that and actually takes it even further. There are, however, recommendations that I believe require more careful thought. And that's not a re direct rejection, but it's not a rushed adoption either. I think some of the reforms to the format of First Minister's questions, for example, might produce unintended consequences. Every week at FMQs, the First Minister answers questions from opposition party leaders, yes, but also from backbenchers. Uh, and with the TV cameras watching, we know that the, the party leader bit can also can sometimes seem a bit knockabout. Um, but the questions serve a wider purpose too, and that is for Parliament to hold the executive to account. It is there for MSPs to get meaningful answers from the First Minister on a range of issues, whether that's on policy or whether that's on a constituency matter. And I think we need to have a discussion about the purpose and nature of question times. Um, it's supposed to be the disinfectant of sunlight to the workings of government. And I think for me, it is above all about eliciting information. And my concern is that without pre-submitted questions um, at all, which is one of the proposals that is being discussed here, all of the answers might lose their meaningful content. Yes. Johnson. I thank the member for giving way. I think one of my concerns reading this is that actually the question, First Minister's question time would be treated differently to other question times. And actually there, there is a, an important point as to whether or not there needs to be consistency between question times and rather than a special case for FMQs. Ms Davison. Well, I think that's one of the things that we need to discuss. And I think in relation to the, the nature of First Ministers itself, to suggest that um, there's just names on the order paper and there's no questions whatsoever. Um, I, I think what I worry about is that the First Minister has asked a question and just says, well, you may, the member raises a very important point. Let me get the, uh, the, the, the relevant minister to write back to them with the answer. And it loses actually any of its potency at all. And I, I think we need to strike a balance then between putting the First Minister on the spot every week, which of, of course in my current position I quite enjoy the fact that we are able to do that, um, but also allowing him or her to provide meaningful and informative answers on those pertinent questions. Um, and as much as a, an opposition member might seek a gotcha moment from the Minister more than anything else, when we come to this chamber, what we want is answers. Uh, and that's not meant to be a criticism of the First Minister's ability to answer the questions, but it's merely to acknowledge the limit of the level of detail that anyone can really be expected to know. And if the First Minister doesn't know whether it's a question on forestry or on forensic pathology, what sort of chance do they have of being able to make sure that they can give the facts out that the member that's asking the question seeks. So that's one of the issues um, that I think requires further debate. And secondly, um, another one is I think that while some of the changes may seem benign or small, actually cumulatively you can see a significant change in how this parliament operates and one that requires further discussion. And I think that what's, that's most apparent in the recommendations in relation to the, the changing role of the presiding officer. 
Uh, and cumulatively, it makes a huge and significant increase to the powers of the PO in, re in, in relation to parliamentary business questions, as well as MSP conduct. And I, I think that there are things in there that have absolutely uh, no worries for people at all about the presiding officer having a stronger role in ruling on conduct um, and content. Um, I think where we do have to have a discussion is on issues like post-match refereeing. Was that uh, answer up to the required standard on being able to depart from party balance in debate so the presiding officer is able to choose just whoever they want to speak um, at any one time. And the idea that the parties put forward their business to the presiding officer first before it goes to the bureau to decide on times. And my worry is that such a significant extension of the powers might politicise the role in a way that is unintended and would certainly politicise the selection of the presiding officer at the start of every parliamentary term. Um, you know, but I, what I would say is that in our short period of time in this parliament, we have seen a succession of very good and impartial presiding officers and deputy presiding officers who commanded the confidence of the chamber. And they've commanded it precisely because we've seen a neutral appointment system and we've not seen that politicisation of their work. So, presiding officer, these are just a few initial thoughts on the report. I look forward to engaging further with yourself, with colleagues uh, and, and MSPs from other parties and across the chamber as we move to the next stage. And my urge uh, is that we steer this process through the whole parliament and we don't simply have an implementation group bringing measures forward to be passed or not passed at decision time um, without wider debate. Um, I firmly believe that the best days of this parliament are ahead of it and I, I hope subject uh, to the preference of the voters of Edinburgh, I'm permitted to play a small part in that future. Thank you. Thank you very much. John Mason to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to say uh, that my initial reaction to the report is certainly very positive. Uh, there are no dramatic recommendations like a second chamber or changing the number of MSPs. And I agree uh, with that and that our emphasis should be on improvements within the present setup trying to make sure we make, all make the best use of our time eh, as usefully as possible. Eh, a major recommendation of mine in relation to committees was the one referred to by my colleague Colin Beattie, which is to reduce them from 11 to 7. Eh, I think with 7 on a committee, the members are more directly involved eh, for most of the time, whereas once there are 11, the convener has an almost impossible task of letting members question witnesses as fully as they want and should. My feeling, and that of the Commission, is that seven is more efficient and makes better use of MSPs' time. And that would allow a committee like REC, which covers rural economy and connectivity, eh, to be split into two, as I think rural economy and transport and connectivity are such big subjects in their own right eh, that they do deserve their own committees. Now, amongst the other recommendations, I would broadly split them into three categories. Firstly, those that I largely agree with. R10 talks about dropping the initial question for leaders at FMQs, and I think that makes a lot of sense for public understanding, although I'm less sure, as uh, Ruth Davidson has just said about bank ventures, uh, for example, it would make supplementaries uh, very, very difficult, if not impossible. R12 uh, talks about reducing the number of portfolio questions uh, in number, and uh, yesterday we only got to number 11 in portfolio questions, the first one having taken 10 minutes. I accept that was a slightly exceptional one yesterday, but it does give a picture of what our experience has been. R23 talks about reviewing standing orders towards the end of each session. I think that's good. R36, the committee meeting at the same time as the chamber. And as the commission has recognised, that could create a conflict for some individuals but I think it has been too rigid in the past when a committee has struggled to find time to, say, finish a report or give adequate time to witnesses. R38, some weeks with more committee time and some weeks with more chamber time. Again, I think that it makes sense. That could especially be useful at the big first year of a session when there are perhaps less legislation coming through and we could have more time in committee. And similarly, towards the end before recess, as we've found in the last couple of weeks, maybe there's more time needed for stage three debates in the full chamber. Secondly, issues that I'm open to looking at, but I think they do need to be looked at more thoroughly. R15 talks about a five-stage process for legislation. Now, an example of that, where we have almost done that, I think, was with the Scottish Fiscal Commission, where the Finance Committee did do pre-legislative scrutiny and then went on to a normal stage one. But I have to say that became very repetitive, 
and we seem to be going over the same ground again and again. So I think I would need some convincing that all bills uh, need all of that uh, process. R33 talks about engaging youngsters over 14 who do not do modern studies. I think that is an issue because many of us go into schools and speak to modern studies classes. Uh, however, I think the practicalities for the actual schools would need to be looked at uh, because they have a lot of challenges and a lot of things on their plate. R50, talking about flexibility and allocating speaking time, and uh, we certainly have had some bills, I'm thinking particularly of DPLR members on the Scottish Law Commission bills, uh, where we struggled to get speakers because the subjects were so uh, intense, and I think I've spoken to all three of these. So I actually thought we could start on that today and that I would take a minute off Kenny Gibson's speaking time and he, he could have a minute less. Um, thirdly, those recommendations that I'm less keen on are 37, a second debate at the same time as the main debates, which seems to me a bit aping Westminster Hall uh, down south, which frankly are not that well attended, having been at quite a number of them. Uh, and I think we do have members' debates which serve much the same purpose. R58, paying committee chairs more. Uh, if there's more time, if, if somebody's having to spend more time on a committee, they're going to have to either do, uh, reduce other committees or reduce other duties. So I would question why they need to get uh, money spent on that. So in summary, I do welcome the Commission's work and especially John McCormick, who has headed it up and whom I have found to be very accessible. And I do commend this report to members' discussion and further consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And first of all, let me echo the thanks to the Commission uh, and the work of John McCormick and, and others. Um, I think that it's uh, vital that we see reform not just as a, a one-off thing, but a, an ongoing process. You know, I'm somebody that grew up in the 1990s when I became interested in politics was very much within the context of the constitutional debate and the arguments for devolution. I think the, the prospect of a new parliament bringing new politics was one that was very exciting. And I think it says much about this place and, and what we've achieved here, that actually that the critics uh, and, and the detractors of the possibility of devolved, uh, devolved parliament ha have been silenced uh, across this chamber, across different parties where there was evidence and, 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 and critics. Those people are now, uh, and parties, very supportive. Um, but having come to this place um, as a new member over the last year, I have noticed that there is a sort of creeping sense that some things happen because that's the way they've always been done. And I think that we need to fight against this. That, uh, you know, if we're being frank, I think sometimes the, the proceedings in this place can seem procedural, uh, dictated by process, and sometimes what happens in here can seem scripted. So I think the commitment of the Commission to look at how we can make sure that Parliament is open, relevant, and above all, authentic, so that what we say in here actually resonates with people out there, I think is important. So I think it is important that we look at our processes, but I'd also say to members, I think it's really important that we all take our duties uh, as parliamentarians uh, seriously, that we personally seek to do our part to, to achieve those things as well. So I think, like others, I think we need more opportunities to discuss the details of the, the, the findings of this report. So I'd just like to focus on, on three key areas. First of all, I think overall, I think the focus on ensuring that we have enhanced scrutiny is right. I think that, I, that the key point that the, the, the report makes that we need to make sure that this principal duty of this chamber is about holding the government to account is absolutely right. So in that regard, I think proposals around the ability to recall ministers uh, in a number of circumstances are good. I think the, the, the looking at how the legislative process takes uh, place, I think, is, is also right. And I, and I I bear in mind what John Mason has just said about the, 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 maybe some of the consequences of the five-stage process, but nonetheless, I think the ability to return uh, a bill to committee, I think, is one that leads uh, looked at. Likewise, I think that the opportunity to, for committees to make statements to the chamber is an interesting one in terms of uh, you know, opening the chamber up, making sure that it is relevant and that it, 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 it has that scrutiny function. Above all else, I think what is important is the principle is that this place uh, is one where the government is formed at the discretion of Parliament. It's with our permission and the powers of this place which are delegated to the government and that Parliament doesn't exist at, at, at the convenience of the government. And I think that is important and one that is always a, a difficult one for parliaments and governments to tread. Um, and I'm not just saying this for, for, for your benefit, presiding officer, but I do welcome a lot of the, the, the proposals to enhance the PO. I think 
that it could have a, a, a good deal to contribute towards the quality of contributions. And ensuring that the PO um, can respond much more in terms of the conduct and relevance of speakers, I think, will help the quality of debate. And likewise, and I'm glad James Kelly isn't in the chamber right now, but I think trying to remove some of the powers of the, the business managers in terms of setting speaker lists and order of speakers, I think would be helpful in that regard too. Um, <laughs> they're going to clipe on me later, I know. Um, li likewise, um, I, I think the, the, the recommendations around committees, I think, are, are worth a, a lot more scrutiny and could be very helpful. Committees, after all, were meant to be the centrepiece of this parliament and I think have also been something that has been uh, uh, of interest to other parliaments who have imported some of our practices. But I think we do need to look at how they function. I think the size of the committees will, will undoubtedly help, as other speakers have mentioned. And I know that there is some disquiet about the possibility of committees running in parallel to the chamber. But my one observation would be is that the Education Committee has run a number of different formats of meetings, uh, not always in informal session, which have been very useful in terms of gaining those wider views. And I think those sorts of informal sessions, such as focus groups and other uh, 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 engagements such as that, could quite easily happen at the same time as the Chamber here. And I think given committees that responsibility to decide whether or not they can operate um, in the afternoons, I, I think is, is sensible. I think after all, I mean, I think we should let them decide, committees decide, uh, whether or not they can do so in parallel with this chamber. So, just in closing, I think this is an excellent start. Uh, the, the focus on scrutiny, quality is right, but I think we do need to, to, to take things further and ensure wider openness and relevance to the public. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Just remind members that we're trying to keep our time to four minutes today. Four minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As others have said, I um, also thank all of those involved in the Commission and support the principle and the concept of ongoing reform. Last week, I uh, welcomed on, on Friday some uh, young constituents, some of which were my constituents, some were Ruth Davidson's, the, the Broughton Runners, who are a local uh, running group of primary school children. and. Uh, they, they came in on Friday and they, they sat up there in the public gallery and we, we uh, myself and a tour guide told them about the parliament. And it was the first time since being elected that I sat up in the, the public gallery. And the perspective uh, that it gave me is something that I would encourage all to, to maybe just pop up there from time to time and try to remember how others see us. And I think this report embodies a lot of that. And Ruth Davidson has already spoken on, on much of the points uh, that I was going to raise, but I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on them further. And that's around FMQs. As the report rightly says, uh, FMQs for much of the Scottish public is the only way they access by radio, television or online in terms of their, their contact with the parliament, or certainly the most prominent. It is the shop window to this place uh, for many, many of our constituents and, and most of the Scottish public. Some people have said to me over the years and, and, and since I've, I've been elected, and including one party leader, that you know, FMQs is just theatre, it's not symbolic of what actually happens in here. And that's true, but it's also the most prominent piece of parliamentary activity that people see, the exaggerated language, the amplified conflict, the, the knockabout, as, as Ruth Davidson described it, the ambition within the whole process of it to get a press headline or a, or a good tweet out. And I think within the report, there seems to be an implicit ambition to try and change that and to try and mitigate and reduce some of that uh, tribalism because, uh, and uh, perhaps over amplified conflict. Because out there, and certainly uh, the report seems to reflect this, and it's definitely been my experience both before and since being elected, is that there is an ambition amongst those in our communities to have an FMQs that is much more substantial and that is more of a, a positive reflection and a constructive reflection in our democracy. And if you, know, you think of the, the issues that are confronting that generation of, of kids that were in that public gallery with, with me last week, climate change, Brexit, how we future-proof our economy, is our shop window of our democracy as 
robust and as uh, constructive and intellectual as we wanted, we'd want it to be to confront those issues. Uh, yes? Anna Johnson. Part of the reason people know, or pay attention, because it is dramatic, and if it became less dramatic, people would pay less attention. And, and I just wonder what the member would ben think about it. I think there is, and I think some people who are interested in, in uh, p party politics are attracted to FMQs because of that. But I think there also needs to be an understanding that a lot of people aren't attracted to the way party politics is right now. In fact, they're very negative and very cynical about it. And I think recommendations 10 and 11 seek to try and address some of that. But I share the concerns that were expressed earlier that I think an over-concentration of spontaneity might create less meaningful answers and actually reduce the implicit ambition in the report to try and create a more constructive debate. I think there are other options around FMQs that we could explore that could maintain that spontaneity and maintain uh, evaluation and, and, and scrutiny of government, but also help us to change our culture to create a more constructive uh, approach to the, the shop window of our democracy. And I don't think that's just about us as politicians, incidentally. I think the press and other elements of our uh, civic uh, society when it comes to our democracy have a role to play. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. Andy Whitewin to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Like other members, I very much welcome this report and want to thank the Commissioners. I'd also like to thank the staff, in particular the Head of the Secretariat, uh, Jane Williamson, who I see sitting at the back of the Chamber. look forward to welcoming her back to the Local Government Committee uh, after recess. Um, I just want to make three kind of broad observations and then some highlights. First, I think there's a strong case for treating the recommendations in this report as a package. I'm conscious that a lot of thought and debate has gone into uh, the report, and particularly the non-MSP members and those who gave evidence gave their time and expertise freely and in good faith, and I think we need to respect their intentions so that this should not become a cherry-picking exercise by members and parties in Parliament. We're responding in substantial part to the expectations of the people whom we serve, and we should bear that in mind at all times. Second, I think the Commission is right to stop short of radical reform at this stage and propose a range of modest reforms across the whole range of Parliament's work to increase effectiveness about how we operate. And third, I think it's, the Commission is correct to urge Parliament to implement these recommendations this session. So to some sort of highlights, um, legislative scrutiny, I, uh, I'm very supportive of the proposal to increase the number of stages in legislative scrutiny. Passing legislation is one of our core functions. And my first experience back in the first session as an outsider um, in Parliament then was with the Land Reform uh, Bill. And I, I went into my, um, the bowels of my archives and, and dug out a very musty copy of the then Scottish Executive's Land Reform, the Draft Bill paper, uh, which was a very a hefty tome of 192 pages, which was the government's intentions and policies and explanation, including a draft bill that was put out for public consultation before it came to Parliament. And the whole process was helped enormously uh, by that. Interested parties could engage with a real statute, could understand the real meaning of statutory um, uh, 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 clauses and interrogate its real meaning and purpose. And the bill that was introduced uh, was much better uh, as a result. Uh, so I would go further, actually, than the Commission's recommendation 15A uh, and suggest that a revised stage one should be a full pre-legislative scrutiny in the form of a draft bill. On parliamentary business, I welcome the proposal that Parliament should take far more control of the parliamentary uh, business uh, schedule. On committees, I'm firmly of the view that committee conveners should be elected. At present, there is no evaluation by anyone other than the party hierarchy as to who's best qualified to convene committees. And the work of committees is vital to the success of Parliament, and I'm attracted to the, by the proposals to have different meeting patterns of committees and chambers. Clearly, this would be a significant change, uh, but for demanding committee work, including budget scrutiny, much more focused time spent in committee to undertake more concentrated work would be uh, beneficial. And finally, on committees, I think Parliament should take more control over its own committee structure than simply following government portfolios. For example, it's a matter of some irritation to me that the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee that I sit on does not include energy in its title, even though this is a very substantial and important part of the committee's responsibilities. 
On a question not covered by the report, it might also be worth designating a week at the end of summer recess as a committee away day week so that members can plan to be available for business planning and away day meetings. I'm conscious that many members cannot make committee away days, uh, etc., because of holiday uh, and other plans over, over, over recess. On other one other recommendation stood out for me was in relation to Scottish Law Commission bills. Some months ago, I asked the government what plans it had to implement the recommendations of the Commission to modernise the law of the foreshore and the seabed, a topic of contemporary relevance given the devolution of the Crown Estate. The Commission was initially asked back in late 1919 to look at the law and produced a final report and draft bill in March 2003. But fully 14 years later, the Minister told me on 11th July last year that there are no such plans. And this seems to be rather unsatisfactory given that we've spent much of the last year not actually enact, enacting any legislation at all. And finally, on speaking and debates, presiding officer, I'm aware that my allotted time is shortly up. Now, on many occasions, I think members may welcome hearing no more than four minutes or six minutes from an, any member. But on many occasions, I, I think, others would value listening to a fuller contribution from members who bring more substantial contributions to debates than some other speeches, and therefore more flexibility in time, as how time is allowed would, I think, add to the quality and flow of debate. Thank you very much, Mr Whiteman. Mike Rumbles, to be followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, on behalf of the Liberal Democrat group, I'd like to put on record our thanks to the Chair and all the members of the Commission who've done such great work. And I, I think they've produced a fantastic report. Um, how can you do uh, justice with 75 recommendations in just four minutes? But uh, I, I can't cover that, all of that, so I'm going to concentrate on one particular aspect. But before I do, I just want to congratulate also the presiding officer, because his idea of having an MOT as to how the Parliament works after 18 years is an absolutely um, good thing to do. So what I'm going to do is I, I want to focus on what's in the report, not what isn't in the report. Uh, there are several things that I put forward and others that isn't in the report, but let's just focus on, on what's in it. Um, and I, I, therefore, I'm only going to focus on the recommendations 43 to 45, which pertain to the Parliamentary Bureau procedures. And as a member, as a current member of the Parliamentary Bureau, I feel that I'm qualified to comment on that, and as a previous member in previous parliaments. Um, the first one, recommendation 43A, to enable MSPs to observe parts of the Bureau's proceedings. Now, this might sound incidental, but actually in a parliament of openness and transparency, I'm astonished that over the years, as MSPs can attend the committee meetings, any committee meetings at all, and can be speak at any of those meetings if called upon by the convener. But we're not entitled to attend the Bureau. And I think it's a really good uh, recommendation that uh, MSPs can observe parts of its proceedings. I would like them to observe them all, but parts I accept. I'm not straying from the recommendations. I have to say, it was a, mysterious, a mystery to me, the Bureau, in the first two parliaments that I served here. In the very first parliament, I didn't know what the Bureau did. I was on one occasion summoned, well, I felt summoned, I was requested to attend. I felt summoned to appear before the Bureau to explain something on the Standards Committee. I thought, what on earth is this Bureau all about? We need to know what the Bureau is about, and we can't make assumptions. So MSPs should be there to observe parts of its proceedings. We should ensure that the views of either individual MSPs not represented on the Parliamentary Bureau are taken into account. It doesn't apply in this Parliament, but it did in previous ones. And I think that should have been, and I'm pleased we're addressing that now for the future. Enable each party or group to open and close debates, but with time allocated reflecting their party balance in Parliament. I also think that this is a very fair approach and I'm pleased to see this reform there because I think it does enhance if we have these uh, open and closing uh, participation of all the political groups rec re recognised in the Bureau, it, it adds something to the parliamentary debate rather than being lost later down in the debating process. To enable all parties or groups to be able to ask a question following ministerial statement is absolutely right. And also to provide a more detailed business motion for the forthcoming three weeks of business in the Chamber. Recommendation 44, in order to foster a greater sense of ownership of the business programme, any member of the Parliamentary Bureau should be prepared to propose business to the Chamber. And it's just, I think, through precedent and where we operated that, that the, the Minister for Parliament does, does that. But it has happened before, and I think we should get into that system again. And time should be provided in the Chamber at the end 
of each week for questions on the forthcoming business program. I think that's actually a very good suggestion. And I would, I'm conscious I've only got a few seconds left. I would agree with Andy Whiteman's comments from the previous speaker. It would be easy to cherry pick this report and to say, oh, I like this one or I like that one. But actually, there's a tremendous amount of work has gone into this. And it's been agreed on an all-party basis and a non-party basis. And I think these 75 recommendations should be implemented as best we can. Some of them will need changes to standing orders. Some of them can be done, the Bureau ones can be done by the Bureau uh, when we next meet. Um, and some, some take a bit longer. But actually, I think it should be taken as a package. We should be open, we should be transparent, and certainly the Bureau should be as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rumbles. I call Liz Smith to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I add my own thanks to the extraordinary work uh, that everybody involved in this project has undertaken? Uh, I'm very fortunate to be uh, in my third session of this uh, Parliament. And uh, I would like to focus my remarks on the committee system and how we could improve legislative scrutiny. And I do so mainly because of some of the concerns that I've had, most especially at a time of majority government, when I believe in some instances the scrutiny was not as comprehensive as it ought to have been. To illustrate this, uh, I cited one example of an education committee session which was dealing with stage two of a very complex bill. The committee papers were very extensive, as were all the appendices, all of which resulted in a very large number of relevant questions of both substance and semantic presentation. As we came to debate some of the most contentious and difficult amendments, a steward was commandeered from the room by a member of the Whip's office from one particular parliamentary party and was delegated to hand envelopes to all that party members in the committee. It became apparent that this was an instruction about how to vote, yet none of these members participated in the debate. And it wasn't the only time that that happened. And I make the point for one important reason. If the result of the vote is to be a fait accompli, what incentive is there to undertake the necessary preparation for that committee session? And what incentive is there to scrutinize in detail? Presiding officer, I think that makes for lazy politics and I think it makes for lazy politicians. Mm -hmm. That complex bill was what became the Children and Young People's Scotland Act 2014. And politics completely aside, members will be aware that the information sharing provisions within this legislation were blocked by the UK Supreme Court a year ago and it led to comment within the legal world that this situation would have been entirely avoidable had we had a wholly competent and effective scrutiny of it beforehand, particularly at stage two. Now, as the report quite rightly notes, it's crucially important that in a unicameral parliament, the committees are robust and seem to be independent of the government. I wholeheartedly agree with that, as I believe it is very necessary to introduce greater objectivity to the committee process. Yes, of course. Patrick Harvey. Member Sorry. for giving way, uh, and I take seriously the comments uh, that, that this uh, serious argument she's making shouldn't be seen in, in, in too political terms in respect to that particular issue. But would it be also a requirement if we were to make this kind of change that members have access to some degree of impartial uh, legal interpretation uh, of legislation, which government at the moment has, the presiding officer at the moment has, but individual members don't? Absolutely, Mr Harvey. I think that you make a very good point on that. Uh, and I think when it comes to some of the other recommendations within this report, particularly about having five stages, one of the things I would like to see in the sort of pre-legislative stage is exactly that informed and objective legal advice, which allows all members, whether they're on that committee or not, to take a much more informed uh, opinion. So, yes, I do accept that. I think I'm not going to spend too much time on some of the other issues within this report because I do believe very firmly that the best part of this parliament is often within the committee system. Uh, I think that we flourish as MSPs, we flourish as parliamentarians if we do that work within committees uh, effectively. And I think that goes for all political parties uh, to take up the cudgel of ensuring that we are debating properly, that we are preparing properly, and that we are as informed as we possibly can be. So if there's one recommendation that comes out of this report, it is to improve the, the scrutiny of the committee system. And I will leave it there, presiding officer, because I think that that is one of the most important things that we have to do. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Edward Mountain and Mr Gibson, after Mr Meeson's comments, you only have three minutes. 
Presiding officer, in the last session, your predecessor was also keen on reform. The main changes that we saw were the introduction of topical questions and a move to three days of plenary, which no one really wanted, but which only myself and Margaret MacDonald didn't vote for. As I see it, this resulted only in less time being spent by MSPs and their constituencies. And the last presiding officer uh, uh, suggested to the Convener's Committee that committees of their membership reduced to only three or four MSPs. This we rejected on the basis of party balance, lack of scrutiny and workload. Only a week later, at the David Hume Institute, the same presiding officer suggested out of the blue that the current setup should be replaced by four mega committees with loads of members. Changes should only be implemented that will make this parliament work more efficiently and effectively, and we should not be too hard on ourselves. Compared to that ossified parliament in London, where it can take 40 minutes to vote, free snuff is available and members have a place to hang their swords, yet need to queue for a prayer card to get a seat on busy days, we are positively enlightened. Regarding the Commission's report itself, I'm struggling to get too excited, although there are many positive suggestions. There is, however, some navel-gazing. No account appears to be taken... Mr Gibson, would you just move your microphone up a little bit? MSPs, apologies. Um, no, no account appears to have been taken of the workload of constituency MSPs vis-à-vis -vis list members. Having been both, like a number of colleagues, there is no comparison yet. With all the extra work anticipated by these reforms, of interest, in my view, mainly to those in the Holyrood bubble, no consideration appears to have been given on how the extra work that would be needed to deliver these reforms on an ongoing basis would impact on constituency members, especially with more powers and the increasing workload that will bring. The election of conveners by the entire parliament has again raised its ugly head. Last year, we had 51 new members elected. How could they possibly know the strengths and weaknesses of umpteen individuals going forward for so many positions? Political parties know best who their representatives and conveners should be. Of course, the report has some good points, and remuneration of conveners is long overdue, although sadly the report fudges this. Uh, not surprisingly, last year, the Conveners Committee overwhelmingly supported remuneration. The dissenting voice uh, was an MSP who announced he would not be standing for election the very next day. Uh, and of course it didn't get support because the Conveners Committee has to be unanimous. Conveyorship is a responsibility I believe every convener takes seriously. I know the Parliament voted against remuneration many years ago in one of its hair shirt moments for fear of a dodgy Daily Mail headline, but remuneration should now be embraced. One step forward which I think uh, is important is that committees should abandon prepared questions. It is shocking that this still happens. I stopped at the minute I became convener of finance in 2011. It meant that members had to actually read their committee papers rather than turn up 15 minutes early, which I won't do, to be allocated a question written by the clerks. The result when members have to think for themselves is a better informed committee, more able to scrutinise independently, which is, of course, uh, what uh, a member many MSPs are obviously deeply concerned about and indeed is the report. Motions, well, it wasn't, they weren't actually touched on really in the report, but surely it's time to scrap those which congratulate every single organisation given an awards for all grant each month and which clog up our inboxes. Lastly, I'll touch very briefly on questions. I'm disappointed the Commission thinks that for general questions and portfolio questions, fewer are the answer. Uh, my own contribution, which was not named in the report, although it was submitted, is, was, as you'll know, presiding officer, to extend general questions from 20 to 30 minutes and portfolio questions from 40 to 60 to allow more members to uh, contribute. And I don't believe the opposition spokesperson should be guaranteed a supplementary. How does that square with the supposed aim of reducing the influence of whips and party managers? And just to touch on Neil Finlay's point, uh, his concern about uh, one or more parties perhaps whipping a committee, I can absolutely tell you uh, without fear of contradiction that this does not happen in the SNP group and certainly never has done. As for suggestions, First Minister's question are not published. I agree with the points made by Ruth Davidson on this. How can backbenchers come in with supplementaries if they don't know what will be asked? That cannot deliver better questions and answer the answers the commissions want. Uh, it would wish. Uh, and and it just, it, it's far as Mike Rumbles is concerned, I don't think we should just accept this as a package of 75 recommendations. I think each uh, recommendation is worthy of scrutiny. And I'd just like to thank the Commission for the huge amount of work it actually uh, uh, did. Um, uh, is been a, has been a monumental task they have undertaken, and it certainly gives us plenty of food for thought. Thank you very much. Edward Mountain to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd also like to thank the Commission and all those who worked on the report. There's two subjects I'd like to cover. The first relates to committees, and the second relates to questions. 
I absolutely concur with the Commission that a strong and effective Scottish Parliament needs strong and effective committees. They are, as the report states, the engine room of this Parliament. The report goes on to state that some committees have not been effective as anticipated. The reason for this, the report states, is mainly because of party discipline, high levels of work preventing committees setting their own agendas, they carry out little or no post-legislative scrutiny, and the turnover of membership is too high. Now, the report goes on to say that there needs to be a way of loosening party control over committees. Now, I've only been in this parliament for a year, and as a convener of a committee, my party has never told me what to do. I cannot speak to what other parties do. Perhaps they need to exert influence on their committee's members, but I don't believe the Conservative Party has ever done that, and it certainly hasn't done it in the short time I've been in this parliament. Now, what I've come to see in the short time that I've been here is the committee works best when the party politics are left at the door. But, presiding officer, this is a parliament. It's all about politics and party politics. And, frankly, to expect politicians to ignore what drives them is, with the greatest respect, or in my view, might be fanciful. That brings me on to the key area I want to look at, and that is the appointment of conveners. Currently, once the split of the committee conveners is agreed between the parties, the individual conveners are appointed by the party. The proposal is that the, party would, sorry, the parliament would elect by ballot the conveners. The suggestion is that the party member could stand to be, any party member could stand to be a convener if they are in the party which has been agreed to have the convenership. In my humble opinion, this will not help. I cannot see anyone standing for the convenership of a, of a committee without the support of their party. And just for the sake of discussion, let us say there were two candidates. One candidate had a deeply detailed knowledge of the committee's area of work, and one did, did not. Is there any doubt that the government would direct their MSPs to vote for the weaker one to ensure that the scrutiny of them it will be less? In a parliament where there is no majority, this might not be an issue. However, this will not always be the case. So I don't really believe that parliamentary committees, sorry, th that this will make parliamentary committees less political and more effective, or in greed will, indeed will generate greater respect for conveners. I, presiding officer, believe that the current system works well. I believe that the appointment com of conveners is something a party does not do lightly. Yes, I'll, I'll take an intervention. Daniel Johnson. I just wonder how the member squares that with the experience of Westminster, with the election of, of committee chairs hasn't really resulted in, in what he just described. Well, I, 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 truthfully, I, I, I follow what goes on in this parliament a lot more than Westminster. And what I'd like to, to, to say is that I actually believe, and I strongly believe this, that the party does ensure that they try and get the best person for the job for the simple reason that a bad convener will cause more problems they can solve and will quickly bring their party into disrepute. disrepute. So I'd like to mention one more thing on committees. A big committee, as we have heard, is difficult to manage and results in less detail and probing questions. And I agree with the recommendation three, which states a maximum of seven members would be optimal. There is much else within the report regarding committees that I agree with. But due to time, I'd like to briefly one different matter. Presiding officer, when I accompanied you to the Canadian Parliament, we watched the procedure at question time. Time for questions and answers was strictly limited, allowing more of both. What I have learned in this Parliament is that you seldom, if ever, get a straight answer to a question. I would make this plea. Let's ditch the long and verbose answers we often hear. Answers that often answer the question the answerer wants to answer and not the question that's been asked. I urge this Parliament to consider following the Canadian system with the presiding officer operating a strict guillotine system. Politicians would soon learn how to be effective and dot, stop dissembling with short rather than long answers. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity and I look forward to seeing how the Commission's report proceeds. Thank you. Claire Adamson, followed by Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I also thank the Commission for their work in this area and their attendance today uh, at the debate in the Parliament. As convener of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, I'm very aware that a lot of these um, recommendations may come before my committee, but I want to make it clear that today I'm speaking 
On my own behalf, as the committee have made no determination themselves on the report at this stage, although we may return to that um, later in the year. Um, I, it's been a very interesting debate to hear recommendations. Um, I'm a bit confused by Mr Mountain's last um, comments about um, First Minister's questions when we've been talking about how debate would be better by the ability for people to have longer time to, to, to give answers that are, are, are meaningful and to, and to have more time to con contribute in debate time. To then have a strict guillotine system, I'm not sure would achieve the results that um, he, I know he genuinely wants to achieve in terms of um, the response from ministers. So I'm not sure I'm convinced by that. Yes, I will. Thanks. Edward Mountain. Sorry, I, I perhaps badly explained that, but in, in the Canadian Parliament, the presiding, oh, sorry, the speaker sits in his chair, and as the question is answered, he moves his hand down so the answerer can see how long they've got before the hand stops. And when the hand comes down, that's the end. Now, politicians answer really quickly because they're frightened of not getting their point across. That would probably stop long answers which delay backbenchers getting in more questions. Clear that would you agree? No, I, Sorry. No. <laughs> I, I take Mr uh, Mountain's point as an interpretation of that procedure, but I've also listened to people saying that, um, you know, very often when debate is constrained by such um, timings, then people get disappointed in that they can't fully explain and they can't fully deliberate on the areas that they want to. So I think there, there needs a bit more consideration and discussion on that. Um, I, we do have very little time today to consider what is, is quite a major piece of work. Um, I'd like to comment on a couple of areas already um, talked about, about the size of committees. I do think I have not sat on a committee where there have been a large number of members, but I have observed some of those committees and um, looked at the OR, and it seems that you know, it can become unwieldy and very difficult for um, meaningful and, um, you know, um, uh, in, you know, questioning to, to, to be able to continue when a member is, is pursuing a particular point. So I agree that um, smaller committees are, are probably the best. I'm very glad that the Commission has looked at the timetabling of the, the Parliament. Okay. Uh, I'm not as experienced as many, many members in here, but I have gone through that change of moving from when we had a committee day to three plenary sessions. And as someone who sat on a Thursday morning committee, I think the, the constraints and the time for that committee sitting on a Thursday morning uh, very often um, was detrimental to the work of the committee, which we've all um, talked about, about how important that is today. Um, I, I welcome some of the broadening of the scrutiny and the opportunity for proposed legislative scrutiny. I think that's, that's very welcome. Um, uh, many of the points I was going to, like um, Ben McPherson, many of the points have already been covered today, but um, something that hasn't been spoken about is some of the wider issues and engagement that um, the Commission have put a great deal into. So I'm, I'm very, very glad to see that they are looking at the diversity and the opportunity for people to engage in the committee process. And I think that that's, that's hugely important. And someone from an IT background, I have to commend um, R65, which looks at the review of the digital communication strategy, um, which I think um, the National Assembly of Wales have done some significant work on. And I think that's definitely something that this parliament should commit, consider. But for me, um, a recommendation R30, which looks at the human rights aspects of our parliament, as opposed to our committees or individual MSPs, but how the parliament is perceived. I think when we're in a situation where we, where we have uncertainty about where Mes Westminster is in pulling away from human rights and we, Brexit will impact people's um, ability to access some things, some things like the ECHR, that the rec recommendation about human rights, um, a stronger role for human rights within the Scottish Parliament our legislation is hugely important. And um, again, I thank everyone for their efforts in producing this report. Thank you very much. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Since 1999, the Scottish Parliament has gained more and more powers, and we as MSPs now have responsibility for more policy areas uh, across Scotland than ever before. It is therefore incredibly important that we continue to evaluate the effectiveness of this place uh, and the, as a legislator and adopt uh, the way things are moving forward. It is therefore very important 
uh, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity uh, to, to commend the Commission for giving us this opportunity uh, to look at uh, the whole way it is evolving. And myself, as a brand new member, being here a year, uh, have come in and I was more than happy uh, to put forward a submission myself uh, as a fresh pair of eyes, uh, so that gave the, me the opportunity uh, and also the Commission the opportunity. There are few, uh, many recommendations within that I am very uh, pleased to see. Uh, anything that gives us uh, a more uh, opportunity, uh, that gives us more uh, capacity uh, and, and strengthens the Parliament, I think are very, very welcome. Uh, and I'd also like to welcome the suggestion that committee conveners should be elected. Uh, I, I fundamentally think that this is a good way forward. This would allow members to set out their own agendas and scrutinising the executive. In doing so, it would strengthen the role of the backbench member by creating committee conveners who had their own distinct mandate uh, for direction that they wished the committee to go. Uh, the committee uh, was discussing the timings, the format and the membership. These are all very important uh, for uh, the parliament to, to discuss uh, uh, and to uh, evaluate. Moreover, I am pleased to see that the suggestion that we will have a five-stage legislative process, which is a, acknowledges the, and recognises the importance of pre- and post-legislative scrutiny and asks for the time to be set aside in the work programme for committees to deal with that purpose. That is a good step forward, uh, uh, presiding officer. Wider consideration and the evaluation of getting uh, a, a, of a stage three uh, legislation has also been looked at. Uh, we, we help to ensure that legislation are, is of a higher quality and that is something that we must uh, all embrace. We want to ensure that the quality and the standard of, of the scrutiny that takes place here is, is very important. Likewise, the, the requirement for the Scottish Government to provide a post-legislative statement after a, a set period in time will ensure that these issues will have uh, raised, uh, will be in the importance of the, the whole way of managing legislation and the scrutiny, uh, and it will be addressed. Uh, the greater focus on the pre- and post-scrutiny legislation is also very important. As we go forward uh, in the uh, involving of the United Kingdom's departure from the European Union. Uh, this will put more pressure on the parliamentary time that we have to, to engage and to ensure that we have uh, the right processes. Parliamentarians' time is precious, uh, as is everyone's time, but the, the whole idea of trying to ensure that we engage and we have the views and the skills uh, that are being addressed uh, are, are vitally important. The increased flexibility afforded by allowing committees to sit at the same time in a chamber, as well as the potential for the parallel debates to take place, I believe, presiding officer, gives us once again an opportunity to consider what we do with our time scales. It, it, it's fantastic to be in this chamber and to see the debates that take place, but there are opportunities for things to happen out with this chamber and at other times. Uh, and I think that's very important uh, that, that we can manage that. So as time is moving on, I will conclude, uh, presiding officer, I'd like to pay tribute uh, to the work that the commission has done uh, and the report that's come forward. Uh, and I look forward to seeing how it evolves and to see how we will progress uh, because there is, there is no uh, doubt that, that we need to consider where we're going, what we've done so far, what can be achieved. There's a lot more work to be done, but I think that this is a very, very good step forward. Uh, and as I say, I look forward to participating uh, in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final speaker in the open part of the debate for uh, I ask Joanne Lamont to close, Neil Findlay. Uh, Thanks, uh, President Officer. I didn't intend speaking in this debate, and it was, I just pressed my button, and, and, and thanks uh, for you um, calling me. But I think that's what we need more of. We need more of that, that people can um, not be down on a, a prefixed list, and that's how you get called to speak, that people should be able to do things spontaneously and get involved. Can I thank the commissioners for um, their work, and John McCormack in particular, for um, taking part in a conference call with myself, uh, Alec Neil, Tavish Scott and Oliver Mundell. Uh, we did ask a representative of the Green Party, but unfortunately, just time uh, didn't uh, allow that to happen. But we took part in that conference call um, uh, during the, the, the consultation period. I hope I'm... By Mr. The way, I hope, Finley, just check the microphones pointing straight at him. Yeah, I hope I'm not dobbing any of them in for this. Maybe their party managers didn't know about this. So, yeah. cards in, microphones on. I usually don't have any problems being heard, but anyway, I'll speak a bit louder. Um, so we, we took part in that call, and that was very, very helpful, because we, uh, what we wanted to do during that time is to um, put forward the case of backbenchers and the rights of backbench uh, MSPs in here and seek change. And, and I see 
that a number of those issues um, have been addressed. We put forward a number of suggestions, but the overall principle that we put forward was the need, need for members to act as par parliamentarians in the interest of the people we represent and not to be hogtied and dictated to by, and a, a, a bulk a wee bit here because my party manager is sitting next to me, but by party leaders, um, whips and business managers. If we look at Westminster and we, we can see MPs who have had brilliant parliamentary careers uh, operating out with ministerial office, even out with committees, but holding successive governments to account, uh, often acting and voting in opposition to their own party, maybe labelled as rebels or mavericks. I think they are the absolute epitome of parliamentarians that we want to create. People who are there, who are going to speak up and who are going to take their opportunity to do so, to represent the people that were sent here to represent. And if we look at the moment, um, the way in which the business is managed in here, we see speaking time, debate slots, members' debates, committee appointments are held in the vice-like grip of party managers, whips uh, and leaders. That's how the system operates, um, for good or for bad. You can make your decision. Um, I couldn't possibly comment. All right, I will. Um, I think that if, the, um, if this piece of work does anything, if it frees up the Parliament from that and allows people to act more in the interests of Parliament and the people were sent here to represent rather than the interests of their party and whatever the line is given from top to bottom and that affects all of us, let's not pretend it doesn't, then if, any, if this does anything, that will be the best thing that it will do. Thank you very much, Mr Findlay. And I call on Joanne Lamont to conclude on behalf of the Re Parliamentary Reform Commission. Thank you very much, President Officer. I wonder if you can let me know how long I've got. Eight minutes. It's the first for a while since I had the longest that to speak in the chamber. <laughs> I'll try to make the most of it. Um, first of all, I want to thank the presiding officer for establishing the commission. I want to thank my own party for nominating me to be part of that group. And I want to thank our fellow commission members, both party representatives and non-party representatives, for the very engaged way in which they got involved in this. And I would say to the parliament, that it is important to recognise the, the level of the work that went into as many of the points that have been made in the chamber were thought about and some were agreed and some were disagreed. But don't imagine that this was done lightly or easily, particularly by the non-party commissioners. And it is really important that we take the report um, exceptionally seriously. Now, privileged, I think there's only myself and a presiding officer who participate in this debate who have been here all the way through since year dot. And I would like, uh, in football parlance, to suggest that I have played in virtually every part of the pitch, um, whether it's leader of my own party, whether it's a, a troublesome backbencher, whether it was as a committee convener, whether it was um, as a, a backbencher in opposition or a, an involved in opposition. And I'm working on grandee status as we speak. <laughs> So I do think that I tried, along with my fellow members, to understand, first of all, the importance of the job we were being asked to do and why it mattered. And it matters not because there's a major problem with the Parliament, but because the people of Scotland now recognise it absolutely as part of the institutions of this country. And we don't, in my view, ever want to be in a place where, as, we, as happens in other parliaments, we're told, you can't do that because we've never done it that way. Precisely because we don't have a tradition of existence, I think it's all the more important that we are modern, forward-looking and aware of the need not to be stratified, but the importance of having change. So I want to thank particularly uh, John McCormick for his great patience and my fellow members for really testing every proposal that was put before them and also doing the heavy lifting of going out into the country and meeting with a whole range of groups and organisations. And it was the non-party commissioners who were keen to emphasise in the report that this was a parliament that was working but could do better, as opposed to be a parliament that had major problems. Um, we wanted to strengthen its identity, deliver more effective scrutiny, engage better with the people of Scotland. And I think we've delivered in that remit with a report encompassing 
all areas of Parliament's activities, with 75 recommendations, and it could have been many more. And I want to just comment on a couple of areas I don't think that have been raised before I will attempt to respond to some of the comments that have been uh, made. A theme which kept emerging as we looked at the various aspects of the Commission's remit was diversity. And it is important that all aspects of Parliament reflect the diversity of Scottish society. This applies to the MSPs who are elected and also those to, with whom the Parliament involves in its work. You cannot be what you cannot see, was a phrase we heard more than once in the Commission's work. And while some progress has been made in relation to gender, we considered that greater progress needs to be made. And as a first step, we recommend that the Parliament reports more widely on key aspects of the parliamentary business and MSPs by protected characteristic. The Parliament should then work with the political parties to agree benchmarks for diversity in candidate standing for election to the Scottish Parliament. The Parliament rules should also be reviewed to ensure they are diversity sensitive and inclusive. We have also recommended extending the Parliament's recognition of gender by ensuring the committees themselves reflect the gender balance in the Parliament. And that's not easy as it will require partners to work together, but we do think it is important. We've recommended a number of changes to how chamber time is used, including changes to portfolio and question time, to reduce the number of questions, but increase the frequency with which portfolios are scrutinised. That is not to say we should be asking the ministers fewer questions. It just means we stop the nonsense of selecting a whole lot of questions that people know that we will never get to and have a bit of rigour around the questions that are being asked. And we've also suggested the private siding officer should have a greater role in ensuring more effective debates and scrutiny in the chamber, both in terms of conduct in the chamber and in the accuracy and adequacy of oral and written questions. These recommendations are aimed at increasing effective scrutiny in the chamber and reducing the number of point scoring exchanges, none of which I have ever been involved in, of course. <laughs> but people did tell us that they happened, so there you go. And, so, and the, but actually, seriously, people outside Parliament said that it made them, it put them off Parliament and politics, and that must be our concern. So our recommendations also recognise the frustration we heard from former and current MSPs from across the chamber about the sometimes poor quality of exchanges in the chamber. This is not new, but it is something that we have to address. And when there are poor quality answers, poor quality written answers, what we are seeing are people being moved to for, uh, freedom of information requests, and that cannot be good for the parliament itself. Now, we, I welcome the positive comments many have made today. And as the Commission recognised throughout its report, some of our recommendations will present challenges in their delivery. However, I think an overriding message of our report is that the Parliament has to loosen its stays. Loosen its stays and de haunt. We need to stop this arithmetical approach to parliamentary business. Are we, as any individual party, reduced in our influence by ensuring that somebody who really cares about a particular issue is afforded the opportunity to ask a question or is afforded the opportunity to make a speech? And I believe that is actually very important in terms of us being innovative and perhaps being a little um, willing to ask to take some risks. Now, in terms of specific points, um, I want to just, I'll not be able to deal with them all, but I'll attempt to deal with some of them. I mean, I hear what Kenny Gibson says and I recognise his position, but I do hope in general terms we embrace the need for the, the, to address what the Commission has highlighted. In terms of questions, <coughs> First Minister's questions, it wasn't so much that there wouldn't be specific questions asked, but you wouldn't need the question to be read out. That takes up time, which then doesn't allow more people to come in. We've seen the effectiveness of backbench questions, even if I didn't get called today, presiding officer. But we have seen where they have come in without a script, um, a scripted question first, and I think that it has been helpful. In terms of committee, the most important point was clearly there is some debate about the need for a second chamber. What we do need are committees who are absolutely committed to the role of scrutiny, who will in their own heads contemplate the possibility that what has been proposed may not work because the evidence coming from elsewhere tells us. And we all have a duty to do that and ensure that there is not pressure put on committee members to diminish that scrutiny role by being suggested that it is not in the party interest for them to reflect on that. Um, evidence. I believe that um, the question of the role of the presiding officers, which was raised by Ruth Davidson and others, 
First of all, a question about the Bureau taking ownership of parliamentary business. It was the view of the Commission that the government has, of the day has too much influence in determining what the debates are in here and then feel an obligation to fill up that space while we then crush important debates into a smaller period of time. That cannot be a good um, a use of our time and I believe the presiding officer should have a role in that. And we also also know that in terms of debate, you can, if you like, chop up into four-minute bits. And I remember myself as party leader being given 13 minutes, whether I wanted it or not, when Dr Richard Simpson was sitting at my back, who could easily have made a really thoughtful, longer contribution if I could have lent him four of my minutes or five of them or whatever it might be, or that somebody like Margot MacDonald in her time might have added something to the debate. So it's about flexibility, and we believe very importantly that if debate is going to be living, breathing, we all need to get away from the times, and we will all have done it, when we've been asked to come in and make a speech on behalf of our party because we have to fill the time. We need to stop that idea of filling the time, but actually using the time effectively in raising the issues that are of concern to people. Some couple of little, uh, final little points on the members' debates. I actually think one of the problems with the members' debates is there aren't enough slots. So if you're in a party like mine, you get X number of slots, and you're lucky if you get the chance. It allows more flexibility. It's not a threat to anybody, but allows more of these opportunities. And finally, my last point, I welcome the comments made by Andy Meitman and, among, and I think um, from the Liberal Democrat benches as well, that we should see this as a package. We should work on the assumption we're going to find a way of delivering on this package because it, it was presented as such. That doesn't mean we can't be flexible in our interpretation of it, but I would urge everyone in here in recognising the work that was done, don't look to the bits that will be difficult to deliver. Work from the assumption that we will deliver these because these are the things that came from a, a consultation way beyond ourselves. And if we want to refresh and energise as people, this, we all should have a shared commitment to making it work. Can I thank the presiding officer for establishing the commission, for all those of you, backbench, frontbench, or whatever, who contributed to my colleagues in um, the commission itself, but also to people of Sc Scotland who have shown a great faith in this institution and want it to do well. We should build on that goodwill to make sure we serve the people of Scotland as well as possible. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate in parliamentary reform. Can I also thank all members for their contributions and add my thanks to the members of the Commission, including John Duncan and John McCormick, who are with us today. Uh, thank you. That brings us now to decision time, and members will be pleased to hear that there are no decisions today. It simply falls on me to wish you all well for the summer recess and look forward to welcoming you back, refreshed and reinvigorated in September. <laughs>